Hello, everybody. We can start now. Dear learners, yeah. students, yeah. teachers, am I audible? Yes. Professors, scientists, doctors, colleagues, our HOD Department of Chemistry, Dr. Salmali Chakravarti, our seminar committee convener, Dr. Pitris Bissas, our beloved principal, Dr. Gautam Bhit, our honorable distinguished speaker, Professor Aurobindo Choudhury. Good afternoon, everybody. We are over overwhelmed with joy and enthusiasm that Professor Aurobindo Choudhury, Department of Chemical Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, Education, and Research Kolkata would deliver his scientific talk on the topic uh, liposomes. For am I audible? Hello. Yes, 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 yes. Please continue. On the topic liposomes for targeted cancer therapy and dendritic cell-based cancer immunotherapy in the field of his expertise and recognition to the scientific community consisting of students, teachers, scientists, doctors, pharmacists, and R&D personnel joining through the Google Meet platform from all over India and even a few from abroad. This would be a momentous event of union of scientific urges searching for better survival strategies for humanity and seeking fulfillment. I would request our beloved principal, Dr. Gautam Beat, to deliver his welcome address to this august scientific community. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kati Babu. Uh, first and foremost, I must thank. Am I audible, Kati Babu? Yes, you are Am I audible? nicely audible. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. You're nicely audible. Uh, uh, First and foremost, I would like to thank the seminar committee of the General Mahavidyalaya and the Department of Chemistry of our college. And special thank to Dr. Kapti Gupta for arranging this webinar, national webinar. And uh, today we are going to learn something from Dr. Beta Kushe, Professor of Biology, Professor of Biology and Chemistry both. And uh, we are fortunate enough that uh, we have had some interactions with him a um, few months back and uh, he helped us a lot on um, organizing a national seminar uh, by the department of chemistry and uh, we are fortunate enough again for uh, his uh, giving time us for um, these types of webinar and uh, as uh, all of us uh, you know that that cancer is one of the leading causes of death nowadays, almost 50 percent, as per the statistics of 2017. Uh, of all the people who die from cancer, are of the age uh, 70 or older. And as of the world population uh, is growing and aging, the global number of cancer deaths is increasing gradually. And adjusted for the increase and in aging of the world population, the rate of cancer death has declined but very slowly. Yes, this is true for some countries. The world is making slow progress. Out of all those lung cancers, all those cancers, lung cancer actually kills more people. And as we know, smoking is largely to blame for this. And as the share of the smoker is declining, the rate of lung cancer death following it. Cancer death, so far as the uh, United States of America is concerned, over the last century show that we are slowly making progress against a number of different cancers. And uh, five-year survival rates are also rising. The cancer survival rates differ strongly between different countries across the world. Cancer survival rates open much slower in the poorer countries. And all these statistics are uh, more or less known to us. Now, what we are going to discuss today uh, regarding the therapy, the key of uh, successful cancer treatment depends on many important parameters uh, such as application route and anti-cancer compound 
and the dosage form. Among the administration groups, oral application is most widely used application method. However, the oral administration of many molecules as conventional doses forms is limited due to the, a major problem. The major problem is the low bio. can ensure oral administration and improve the oral bioavailability of the drugs. The introduction of colloidally stable liposomes with low drug leakage rates resulted in a renisha in liposome applications in cancer therapy. Furthermore, the platform of sterically stabilized liposomes also allows the construction of new generations of drug delivery vehicles. These include targeted liposomes and targeted nucleic acid delivery vehicle based on either cationic uh, sterically stabilized liposomes or precondensed DNA encapsulated in neutral or negatively charged liposomes. The le development of therapeutic resistance to targeted antigens of therapy remains a significant clinical problem with intra Humoral heterogeneity playing a key role. In this context, improving the therapeutic outcome through simultaneous targeting of multiple tumor cells, subtypes within a heterogeneous tumor is a promising approach. Liposomes have emerged as useful drug carriers that can reduce systemic toxicity and increase drug delivery to the tumor site. While clinically used liposomal drug formulations show marked therapeutic advantages over free drug formulations, ligand functionalized liposomes that can target multiple tumor cells, subtypes, many further improve the therapeutic efficacy by facilitating drug delivery to a broader population of tumor cells making up the heterogeneous tumor tissue. Ligand directed liposomes enable the so called active targeting or cell receptors via surface attached ligand that direct drug uptake into tumor cells or tumor associated stromal cells. All these, these details will be discussed by our uh, honorable speaker today. The key challenges for the transition or the translation include the lack of established methods to scale up production and comprehensively characterize the legal functionalized liposome formulation as well as the inadequate recapitulation of in vivo tumors in preclinical models currently used to evaluate their performance. Dr. Chowdhury is going to deliver, uh, the, to, uh, going to include uh, his uh, discussion on dendritic cells also. These dendritic cells are discovered long before in 1973 by uh, Raph Steinman received the Nobel Prize in 2011 and uh, was the concept of using these cells therapeutically to elicit or prevent an immune response. As the immune system is involved in many diseases, the ability to manipulate this system can potentially be very useful to introduce tolerance in autoimmune diseases or induce strong immune responses against diseases with otherwise poor immune reactions such as cancer. Now I will request our honorable speaker, Dr. Professor Choudhury, to deliver his lecture and to enlighten us on the said issues. Thank you very much. Now one thing, uh, one thing, hello. Hello. Um, yes, please. Uh, one thing. Yes, it is. Uh, I would like to thank our dear principal for his informative welcome address. Thank you, dear principal. Now it is customary to introduce the hello. It yes, is customary. Please. It is customary to introduce the distinguished speaker. It is a rare privilege and honor for me to introduce Professor Aurobindo Choudhury today's. Distinguished speaker, Professor Choudhury received his PhD degree from Department of Chemistry, Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, United States of America in 1991. 
he pursued his post doctoral research in the department of biological chemistry and molecular pharmacology harvard medical school united states of america thereafter dr choudhury launched his independent research career at csir indian institute of chemical technology hyderabad in 1994 we know each other closely since then he worked at csir iit as chief scientist till his superannuation in 2018 he worked at the interface of chemistry and biology his current research interests are centered around designing efficient liposomal drug and gene delivery systems for use in targeted cancer therapy and dendritic cell based cancer immunotherapy dr choudhury's works have appeared in journals of international repute including biomaterials journal of medicinal chemistry journal of american chemical society jacks nanoscale journal of control release biomaterial science chemical society review molecular therapy bioconjugate chemistry chemistry european journal etc he has supervised phd thesis research of 29 students many of them now established scientist in india and abroad he is presently continuing with his research work in the department of chemical sciences indian institute of science education and research kolkata as government of india's raja ramanna fellow he is an elected fellow of the prestigious indian academy of sciences bangalore fasc and an elected fellow of the prestigious royal society of chemistry uk frsc dr choudhury is an editorial board member of critical reviews in therapeutic drug carrier systems and an editorial advisory board member of biomaterial science a rsc journal he has delivered numerous invited talks institute colloquium lectures in india and abroad dr choudhury is the recipient of 2007 ranbaxy research award in pharmaceutical sciences 2018 Professor Jane Mukherjee Memorial Award from Indian Chemical Society. He is one of the four vice presidents of the Chemical Biology Society India. Also, he is one of the panel members of an international body for selecting lectureship awards. Above all, he is a wonderful human being with compassionate intelligence. One can feel completely secure with him. My reverence and gratitude to him. on behalf of bijanar mahavidyalaya and on my personal behalf i request him tell, to deliver his talk professor choudhury very near and dear one professor choudhury please thank you patik for so much of kind words i'm very excited to see you all here professor beat principal thank you very much for all your wonderful introduction you set the stage actually uh how do i go to my presentation there right yes can you see my presentation just hold on oops hello can you see it now Can you see it? Is it visible? Yes, it's very good. It's very good. It's very good. It's very good. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Can you see it? Okay. Uh, so it's 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 my pleasure to be here among all the students. Hello. Today, I plan to talk about. use of liposomes for targeted cancer therapy and dendritic cell based cancer immunotherapy can you hear me hello hello can you hear me yes we can hear you okay summary of my presentation is i would like to introduce particularly for the students a little bit of 
on liposomes first, and then on liposomes for dendritic cell-based cancer immunotherapy. And then liposomes in targeted cancer therapy, targeted chemotherapy. And then I'll, at the end, I'll be talking about a, a novel combination approach where we have combined these two and would like to share with you the phenomenal result by combining these two techniques simultaneously applying these two techniques in mice, mouse tumor model. It's a powerful platform technology for combating cancer. The field of liposomes, where now about 18 FDA approved liposomal formulations of various drugs are on the market. This entire field owes to this person who started the research on liposomes, the father of liposome research, professor, doctor, physician scientist, Dr. Alec Bangham, FRS, who for the first time demonstrated the existence of liposomes by microscopic experiments. And Liposomes, as you all know perhaps by now, Professor Beat explained it very well, is formed, liposomes are formed by twin chain amphiphilic molecules, like phospholipids. Phospholipids, when they're confronted with water, dissolved in water, their hydrophobic tails, they try to avoid water, and their polar head groups get exposed to water. In the process, they form liposomes. So it's a combination of two Greek words, lipo and zoma. Lipo means fat, zoma means body, so it's fatty bodies. That's why sometimes it's popularly known as fatty bubbles, right? If you look at the structures of the liposomes, very organized structures and they have inside compartment which is aqueous, the outside is aqueous and the bilayer lipid area is hydrophobic, right? The two long chains are sort of squeezed inside and that's the liposome. So you might think that how does it form some organized, you know, some so organized ordered structure and the answer is the familiar micellar studies, right? So apparently it looks ordered, but somewhere more disordered is there. So net entropy is high, positive, right? So if you look at the structure, if this molecule were simply monomolecularly dispersed molecules, then every long chain would be surrounded by a huge number of water, a very unhappy situation, very unhappy ordering, right? So this this can be avoided, the ordering of such a huge number of water along the chain can be avoided if the two, if the long chains and sort of aggregate goes inside and those water are knocked out. So that's a serious, uh, spontaneous entropy driven process, right? So you get a huge energy by freeing the immobilized water from the long chains. That's how it forms. Similarly, that's how liposomes form. Why liposomes are so wonderful? Because their body, the structure of the lipid molecules are close to the lipid molecules of our biological cell membranes, right? So they lovely, nice way they can fuse with the biological membranes and that is why they are so useful, so popular. They can deliver, as I'll talk soon, uh, they can deliver drugs, they can deliver genes to cells, right? So as I told you, my talk will be three parts. First, I'll be concentrating on liposomes for dendritic cell-based cancer immunotherapy. Before I do that, for the chemistry students, 
And for those who are not so familiar with the world of immunotherapy, a little bit first on our exquisite uh, immune system, right? So if you look at our immune system, we are constantly being bombarded by myriads of, of bacteria and microbes and, and, and other you know, disease-causing microorganisms, right? And so uh, how do we are protected? It's our immune system, right? And it consists of basically three layers of difference, right? The first is the physical barrier. It's our skin and mucous liquids. And, and so the, the skins protect us from the microbes. Most of them cannot penetrate the skin. So they protect us from the physical barrier. And then if the uh, microbe, microbes succeed in breaching the first uh, you know, line of defense, which is physical barrier, then there are sentinel of cells there, which are called immune, innate immune systems, immune cells, the, the phagocytic neutrophils, uh, all kinds of immune, uh, innate immune system. Those take care of those microbes and they kill them, they digest and they kill them. And if the microbe is so powerful that it can even reach the innate immune system, then lies the third layer of, final layer of defense system, adaptive immune system. These are either cellular cell mediated, B cell and T cells mediated cell killing, the micro killing system, right? So this is our total uh, in a nut cell. It's borrowed from textbooks and you can see the cells in innate and adaptive immune. On the right side, you see the adaptive immune cells, B cells and T cells. T cells are two types. And in the, in the innate immunity side, there are a lot of macrophages and, and engulfing phagocytic cells, including dendritic cells, basophil, eosinophil, natural killer cells. And in the middle, there are some both uh, adaptive like and in, innate like cells, alpha, delta, gamma, T cell, natural killer cells. Out of all these things in the innate component, dendritic cells are very unique in the sense. Dendritic cells, they can present the antigen fragments to the T cells in the nearby lymph node. So dendritic cells are just underneath our screen, skin, right? So if the invading pathogen microbes, they breach the skin layer, then immediately underneath, dendritic cells are waiting. They take the microbe, they chop it into small fragments, and those small fragments they present on the surface in complexation with major histocompatibility molecules, AMHC molecules, and then they migrate, they mature and migrate to the nearby lymph nodes where the T cells are waiting. Then those, you know, those small fragments associated antigen fragments are presented by the dendritic cells to the T cells, and then the T cells proliferate, activated T cells, and then those T cells go to the site of infection and then kill directly the microbes, right? That's how it works. So this is an extraordinary, exquisite machinery, our immune system. So vaccines traditionally, they are composed of either killed pathogens or pathogen subunits or attenuated, live attenuated viruses, right? And there are some problems with the traditional vaccines. They're mostly protein-based, right? The non-live vaccines don't provide lifelong immunity. And live attenuated viruses can mobilize both cellular and humoral. Humoral response means antibody mediated, and cellular response means B cell, T cell mediated. Uh, response, uh, immune response. However, the degrees of attenuation significantly can lower. So to this end, instead of normal using normal peptide-based, protein-based antigens, vaccination, people are now using genetic immunization. The like COVID-19, for example, the vaccine uh, that's going to be one of the successful vaccines are based on DNA vaccines. For the first, first time in human, uh, and in animal, it has been tested already. 
uh, for horse disease, for example. Uh, but then, so this, every protein comes from a DNA, right? So the DNA vaccination is nothing but a DNA, plasmid DNA, circular DNA, and, and go, uh, encoding the antigenic protein. That's the DNA. The advantage is this, this holds promise for becoming a platform technology. So basically what I say a little bit earlier, that the antigen now in the form of plasmid DNA that enters the skin and right underneath the skin, the genetics, so they capture the antigen and then they process it, chop it in small fragments and then get activated and crawl to the nearby lymph node where the T cells are waiting and these dendritic cells, they present the antigen fragments to the T cells in complexation with the major histocompatibility complexes, which results into the proliferation of T cells, right? And those T cells kill the tumor cells. So a major challenge in the DNA vaccination, therefore, is if you look at this, the antigen has to be presented to dendritic cells, right? And that's a major challenge. How people are doing till now, it's an emerging approach. The current approach was you basically use the manose receptors, which are overexpressed on the dendritic cells. So targeting DNA vaccines to APZ, APCs via manose receptors was the technique that was being used till now. So when we started now, therefore, the, essentially the challenge is what? Challenge is how to deliver effectively a DNA inside the cell. And in this case, it was, the, it was mediated via the manose receptors overexpressed on the dendritic cells. So the challenge of good DNA vaccination is to resolve the challenge of gene delivery, right? Which is a major thing in, in, in gene therapy, right? So the principles of gene therapy is very much applicable to DNA vaccination, right? which is to supplement the body cells with the correct copy of the malfunctioning. In gene, gene disease, some genes are not working. It's not producing the desired protein, and therefore it's a malfunctioning. So you supplement the body with the correct copy of that functioning, malfunctioning gene, right? So what do you do? Basically, the procedure is tedious ex vivo gene therapy. So where, it, where you collect the dendritic cells, isolate the dendritic cells from the patient body, and then ex vivo means outside the body, you transfect those dendritic cells, isolated dendritic cells, with the gene of your interest, the correct copy of the malfunctioning genes, and then those dendritic cells are transfected into the gene. Those genes will be transcribed and translated into the protein, and the dendritic cells will be chopping into small fragments, those proteins, antigenic proteins, and then they'll be presenting it to the surface. And then those dend transfected dendritic cells will re-implant the body. That's how it works in gene therapy, right? So therefore, what kind of liposomes was used to deliver genes into our body cells? Obviously, these liposomes would be having a positive surface on the charge, on the, on the outer surface, right? Positive charge on the outer surface of the liposomes. The first gene therapy trial took place more than 30 years ago. I think, yes, yeah, around that, maybe 34. And, and numerous clinical trials from it, right? Still successful gene therapy, if it says, remains in use. What's the problem? So look at the structure of the biological membrane. The biological membrane surface are negatively charged. And, and DNA is also lots of phosphate, right? So it's a polyanionic macromolecule. So there is a repulsion, right? So a spontaneous entry, electrostatic repulsion between the DNA and the biological cell surface. So you don't expect a DNA to be spontaneously swimming through the biological membrane, right? In other words, problems of gene therapy and gene delivery are sort of inseparable, right? Failure in one, 
is definitely going to ad adversely affect the others. So you need a gene delivery reagent. And contemporary gene delivery reagents can be broadly classified into viral and non-viral. And among the non-viral vectors, there are cationic polymers and cationic liposomes. Our focus is on cationic liposomes. As of now, the gene transfer efficiencies of viral vectors are definitely superior to their, their natural, right? Their nature's own invader, right? So their efficiency is very high. However, the viral vectors are potentially immunogenic. So your immune system may reject it. And virus has a, a limited size, right? The envelope size is limited. So if your DNA of interest is very large inside, that cannot be accommodated inside the viral package. Therefore, and also if it can get inserted into the wrong place, that can lead to mutagenesis and cancer. And viral vectors, uh, viral preparations are difficult to do in large scale. All these alarming biosafety concerns are increasingly making the liposomes, cationic liposomes, as the transfection vectors of choice in gene therapy. So cationic liposomes, which are the fatty bubbles, as I told you, of the cationic lipids, are gaining popularity because they are least immunogenic because their, their molecular structure is like our biological membrane molecules, right? Lipids. Cationic lipids have no insert side limit because it's an electrostatic complex. It's unlike viral vectors, they have a package, they have the inside volume where the DNA is packaged. But here, the liposome uh, and the DNA are electrostatically condensed, complexed. So therefore, DNA just sits on the outside of the liposome. Therefore, no insert side limit. You can deliver a huge, large size of genes to cells using cationic liposomes. And cationic liposomes, this is the best advantage of Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? you are audible. Okay, fine. So cationic yeah. liposomes are, are targetable. This is the very exciting part of it. If you know some receptors is overexpressed in a particular tissue or cell, and you also know a high affinity ligand of that receptor, then you can covalently tag that ligand on the outer surface of the liposomes to target the liposomal cargo to the selectively to that cells, right? And, and handling techniques anybody can learn in one week, and and, and it's, it's simple. And robust manufacture is not a problem anymore. It used to be a problem. Chemical engineers coming have come forward and, and solved it almost. So therefore, it's an electrostatic complex, as I told you, right? So various structures are in, 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 in literature uh, and known. So one of these structures is, is a, like a sandwich structures where the, the you know, DNA double helices are sort of sandwiched in between uh, two adjacent lipid bilayers. And there are also bits on string model where the plasmid DNA is a circular DNA and the liposomes, spherical liposomes, sits on that string. And so it's a bits on string model on atomic force microscopy. So how does it actually, you know, the liposome will carry the DNA inside the cell and the whole lipofection pathway can be summarized. And the first step is therefore the electrostatic complex formation between the cationic liposome and DNA. And it's justifiably called lipoplex, lipo from liposome and plex from the DNA duplex, right? So it's an electrostatic complex, qualitative picture. And the that's the first step of lipoflexion. Lipoflexion means process of transferring DNA into the cell using liposomes, right? What is the second step? Endocytotic cellular uptake of the lipoplex. So endocytosis is what biology people all know, chemists should know now. Uh, those who are interested in, in doing the interface of chemistry and biology, uh, the, a part of the plasma membrane will be utilized in engulfing the lipoplex inside the cell. So that's endocytosis. So the lipoplex now ends up in the endosome. So the endosomal membrane is actually the part of the original plasma membrane of the cell. Now, the, the gene has to be expressed, right? The gene that is being delivered to the cell by the liposomes. So that has to be 
expressed means it has to be transcribed to RNA, mRNA, and then mRNA needs to be translated into the cytoplasm. So the gene gets transcribed inside the nucleus of the cell, right? The, the next step is obviously endosomal release of the DNA of the endosome. And then, if that doesn't happen, if the endosome is kind of fused to the lysosome, thereby, then this danger. The lysosomes are loaded with degradative enzymes. They will chop out the DNA, and you will not get any DNA delivery. So make sure that the DNA is quickly released into the cytoplasm from the endosome before it fuses with the lysosome. And once the DNA is released into the cytoplasm, it makes a nuclear entry. So that goes inside the nucleus and then gets transcribed into the mRNA. And the mRNA comes out of the nucleus into the cell cytoplasm and get expressed on the lysosome. Yeah. And, and now, now we've got a proteins in the inside the cell. So those who are wondering, chemistry students, how to measure whether successfully you have delivered a gene inside the cell. To explain to you, I've made a few cartoons. The first thing is you plate your cells into which you want to deliver the genes into 96 well plates. The cells are with cell medium. Cells are well plated, right? Next, you add the lipid DNA complex, lipoplex, onto the plated cells. And allow the whole process of that thing that I just told you, lipoplexin pathway, to happen. That takes about 48 hours. And then the cells are transfected, genes are expressed. The delivered genes are expressed into the corresponding proteins. Now, you have to know whether that enzyme or protein has been there inside the cell. So what is that protein, to access that protein, you lyse the cell with some detergent buffers. And then the express protein is exposed. And then you add, suppose uh, uh, you are delivering a gene encoding an enzyme, right? And then you add the substrate of that enzyme. And then use a chromophobic, chromogenic substrate that will be converted to some colored material from the color intensity that color, for example, you know, beta nitrophenyl oxide and glucoside that, that will generate beta nitrophenyl, right? Uh, which is yellow in color. From the color intensity, you know that your gene was delivered to the cell, right? So that's how the coming a little bit history of history. First, cationic lip transfection lipids. It was from years back from Stanford and the Industry Group collaboration, Pelner did it. So look at the structures of this lipid. It's a glycerol-based lipids. These two of the OHs of glycerol were ethylified with two long oleoil chains, the 9, 10, 6, double bond. And the third CH2 OH was converted to a cationic trimethyl ammonium quaternite center. So dioloxy trimethyl ammonium chloride, DOTMA. That was the first cationic transfection lipid used for delivering genes inside the cell. Now, when we started work, our work on gene delivery years back at IICT, where I met your Dr. Karthi Gupta, our beloved students, and the hydrophobic, look at the structure. The first structure was glycerol based. And when you looked at the literature when we started our work, all the subsequently developed gene transfer reagents, none of these lipids, nobody dared to change the glycerol backbone of all these R's are long chain, right? In, in, in various subsequently developed structures. So we questioned that. Is it necessary to maintain that? I'm not going to talk about these things today, just to, as a, you know, uh, summarize the whole first question that you asked when you began. That is it necessary to maintain the glycerol backbone? No. We changed the glycerol backbone and subsequently developed many, many efficient cationic infection lipids without having any glycerol backbone in the structures. This is not necessary. In fact, one of the very simple lipids that the non-glycerol based lipids that we made were two to, two to three fold more effective than the commercially available life effect. Now, this gene transfer reagent, now we know, right? The lipoflexion pathway, how does it work? 
Now, one thing before I go on to today's topic, like I say, the nearly cell based in a DNA vaccination in cancer immunotherapy, right? The nearly cell based cancer immunotherapy, it needs to deliver the gene, DNA vaccine, to the dendritic cells. But this cell transcription process by cationic lipids are extremely sensitive to the molecular structure, molecular architecture of the lipid. The cationic transcription lipid can be broadly classified into three domains. One is positively charged head group, structures of cationic transcription lipids. Uh, and then there's a long hydrophobic gel, and there's a linker part that covalently links the positive charge to the hydrophobic tail, right? Now, we are, you know, address a question, uh, specific questions. Look at this structure, this quiz for the chemistry students uh, or anybody here, right? The, if you look at these two structures, the R's are two long chains. And here is a, is a, is a, is a positive polar head group and both the structures are the same. And, and long chains are structures, the more are, both are uh, C13, H27. Both are ester linkages. The only difference is in this lipid one, the ester oxygen is closer to N plus, and in this lipid two, ester carbonyl is closer to N plus. So the molecular weights are same. You don't expect the liposomes to be broadly, closely different from these two lipids, right? And therefore, their gene delivery efficiency should not be drastically different because the electrostatic complex, right? So, based on that, what we serendipitously, we just wanted to address the linker orientation effect. But what we saw, observed, was phenomenally, dramatically unexpected. Only one lipid could successfully deliver genes inside the cell, the one where the ester oxygen was closer to N. Plus. And the other lipid, lipid 2, essentially turned out to be transfection incompetent, completely incompetent. This was quite a dramatic response. That even, you know, that was in, in vitro cell culture. We later on proved that it, this same thing is also true for in vivo gene delivery uh, using an amide instead of ester. Ester is a two labile under in vivo. And, and that Again, you saw in in vivo gene delivery also the one that where the ester the amide NH is closer to N plus was active, the other was inactive. So therefore, this told us how much we don't know about liposomal gene delivery, the structure activity, right? Coming back to today's topic, as I told you, a major challenge in DNA vaccination is to target DNA vaccines to bodies antigen presenting. And the current approach is use covalently a, a tag covalently a manosyl group on the cationic liposome surface. Why? Because the manos receptors are overexpressed on the antigen presenting cells, dendritic cells, aquaphage, and therefore it will go nicely through the atlanta through manos receptors. Right? So we about 10 years back, when we started our work, we for the first time showed that if we replace mannose with the most stable sequinoic or quinoic acid, where all these are, are six carbon, right, instead of one and over eight, that is better than, than manosyl, manosylated cationic lipids. And it goes via mannose receptors. The way you showed that, we saturated the cells with a natural ligand of, of mannose receptors, which is mannan, and then the transfection efficiency went down. That was consistent with the involvement of manos receptor selective gene delivery. Now, we wanted to use this genetic immunization technique, DNA vaccination or genetic immunization, DC based, for cancer, right? So, melanoma was our model. So, what you have to do, the DNA vaccine, as I told you, the DNA vaccine has to encode now melanoma antigen. So melanoma antigen is MART1. It's about 18 kilodalton uh, protein. So that was encoded in the plasmid DNA. That is our DNA vaccine. Now, how do you immunize? How do you check it? What's the procedure? So basically, you take black mice, immunocompetent black mice, and then the lipoplex, the electrostatic complex between the liposomes and the DNA vaccine, 
that you just subcutaneously inject. You're immunizing the mice, right? And then later, after three injection, three immunization, you challenge the mice with lethal dose of melanoma tumor. So the immunized mice should be surviving more than non-immunized, untreated mice. That was the procedure that we showed. But the effect was not that great. All the mice eventually died. It was the first piece of work from our group. Then we realized that more recently, we, we uh, sort of put in that first work, the sigmoic acid or quinoic acid were directly attached to the N plus. Uh, but uh, later on, we put a spacer in between. The balance receptor was enhanced. It, it gave us a better result. And later, subsequently, we realized that no, the DC transmission efficiency was only 5 to 6%. We have to increase it further to get more into, uh, you know, to get more enhanced uh, DNA vaccine delivery efficiency. So what we did is now we put instead of directly putting this sycamoric acid or quinoic acid to the N plus, we put another positive charge in between using a lysine spacer, and that improved the DNA vaccine vaccination efficiency. And if you look at this, unlike the previous one, now the, when we immunize the mice first and then later challenge the immunized mice with little dose of melanoma tumor, 80% of the mice survived without tumor. And those who survived, we again challenged them with little dose of second dose. And this second time also no tumor came. So it's a good memory response. That was fantastic. Now this time, we improved the transfection efficiency from 6 to 12% using one lysine. However, so the ex vivo DC transduction is great in the preventive mode. That means you first immunize the mice and then challenge the immunized mice with tumor. So you're preventing tumors to grow in the immunized mice. But this protocol is pretty involved protocol. If you look at the protocol, what you have to do, first of all, you have to painstakingly isolate the patient's autologous dendritic cells, patient's own dendritic cells, and then outside the body, ex vivo, you have to transfect those isolated dendritic cells, and then re-implant the ex vivo transduce DC back into the patient's body. Therefore, the procedure is clumsy, labor intensive, costly, right? I'm consuming. So we were desperately looking for a liposomes. So we saw that the DNA vaccination efficiency went up when you put a lysine spacer in between the sycamoic acid and the N plus of the cationic layer. Then we decided to further enhance because those were great for ex vivo, but ex vivo method, ex vivo DNA vaccination method is tedious, as I told you, right? It would be wonderful if we do not need to isolate the dendritic cells from the body and outside transfecting, if we don't need to outside transfecting, ex vivo transfecting. If we can develop a lipid that will find the dendritic cells inside the body, that would be wonderful, right? So this is what we did. We covalently transformed that, uh, transformed the lysine and H2 to a guanidine protein. So guanidine PK is around 12, and that stays all the time positively charged in physiological pH of 7.4, right? And that actually enhanced the transfection efficiency to almost 20%. And now there was no need of ex vivo DC transfection technique. You just complex your DNA vaccine, mix the DNA vaccine with the liposomes of lipid 1, just push it into the subcutaneously, it will find the dendritic cells, transfect it, and generate the immune response. And you see, all the mice survive. No, upon tumor challenge, no tumor grew. So you immunize the mice with the lipoplex of lipid one, and then challenge the mice with tumor, lethal dose of tumor, melanoma tumor. None of the mice, in none of the mice, any equals five tumor grew. 
And the second challenge also, 80% of the mice, no tumor. Wonderful. So very nice that no more autologous disease, no more isolation of autologous disease, no more required, right? But this is, again, I said, preventive mode, right? Preventive mode means you immunize the mice first and then challenge the mice with lethal dose of tumor. But who cares? I don't know who wants to take a vaccine, assuming that I'll be having, having cancer in future. It'll be great if, if our system can eliminate an established tumor already, right? I have already tumor, immunize me, I'll be free of cancer. That would be the ultimate, right? But much to our frustration, as I said, yeah, this powerful in vivo DC vaccination technique actually failed to eradicate established tumor. So in the preventive mode, the, all the mice survive. But if, on the other hand, if we develop the tumor first and then immunize the mice, eventually all mice die. Look at the part B. Within 45 days or so, all the mice die. So this is not so the in vivo, even though we developed a powerful in vivo DC targeting system that does not need isolation of the, you know, dendritic cells from the patient's body, but under therapeutic settings means you develop the tumor fast, not the preventive settings, unlike the previous cases, right? Under therapeutic settings, if you develop the tumor first and then treat with the uh, in a lipoplex of the DNA vaccine, the tumor does not disappear, the mice actually dies. So in vivo DC targeted genetic immunization does not work under therapeutic settings, under established, it cannot eradicate established tumor, but it can prevent us from having tumor in future. So now I'll be talking about liposomes in targeted chemotherapy. So liposomes in targeted chemotherapy is obvious, right? The, all you have to do, you have to know, so, so you know, cancer is uncontrollable growth of, of cells, right? So the problem with, with, with cancer research is that the toxic drugs, cytotoxic drugs, the cancer drugs are highly cytotoxic. So you need to develop reagents that will selectively take the drugs to the cancer cell only and not the healthy adjacent healthy cells or in other parts of the healthy cells of the body, right? So side effects has to be reduced, right? The use of liposomes in targeted cancer therapy is that is why getting so powerful, you know, so popular because liposome surface can be covalently modified with high affinity ligands for receptors which are overexpressed only on tumor cells, not in the healthy cells. That's exactly how it works, right? So that is why liposomes are being widely used for targeting potent cytotoxic drugs selectively either to tumor or tumor vasculature. And in tumor vasculature, particularly in the therapeutic mode called anti-angiogenic therapeutic modality, anti-angiogenic cancer therapy. What is anti-angiogenic cancer therapy? This was championed by Professor Judah Hoffman from Harvard Medical School years back, right? Early 70s. Now, what is angiogenesis? As the tumor grows, this is the main, the big red thing is the main vasculature, right? Now, as the tumor grows in size, they start secreting vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, which initiates the process of formation of new blood vessels around the growing tumor. The tumor is growing, so it needs food, it needs nutrients, right? How does it get it? it induces the formation of new blood vessels around it. Angiogenesis means formation of new blood vessel from the existing blood vessel, right? So that's how the tumor grows. Tumor gets you know, bigger and bigger because more blood vessels are, are, are formed around it. So all the blood-borne nutrients uh, are, and foods are, are going to the tumor and the tumor grows happily. So what Judah Falkman from Harvard what he championed this concept of anti-angiogenic cancer therapy. But Judah proposed that if we succeed 
in disrupting the formation, in inhibiting the formation of new blood vessels, in other words, from the existing blood vessel, then the tumor cells will not get their nutrients, not get their foods, so they will die out of starvation, right? That is called anti-angiogenic cancer. So you have to make sure that the cells that form the new blood vessels should be killed by cytotoxic drugs. So therefore, there will be no angiogenesis, no formation of new blood vessels around the groin for the tumor, tumors will die. How to do that? You look for receptors. How to do that? So your anti-cancer drugs or genes has to be now selectively delivered to the endothelial cells that form the tumor vasculature. Right? And how to do that? How to ensure that? You look for unique molecular markers which are expressed only on the endothelial cell surface that form the tumor vasculatures. And integral receptors are such receptors. These are dimeric, heterodimeric, two parts, right? Heterodimeric transmembrane receptor it traverses the plasma membrane and, and glycoprotein receptors. So these are alpha unit and beta subunit. So these are the integral receptors which are overexpressed on tumor endothelial cells and not healthy vasculatures. So what we showed before that if we have liposomes on top of which there is RGDK or RGDGWK peptides, those transfer the genes into the endothelial cells. It's an anti-cancer gene, P53 genes, it will go deliver to the tumor vasculature cells. And, and in this one, there are many integin receptors, about 26 integin receptors, out of which uh, alpha B beta 3, alpha B beta 5, and alpha 5 beta 1 are the most widely used. And this RGDK receptors or so this RGDK lipopeptide is remarkably alpha 5 beta 1 integin receptor selected. Showed that by antibody saturation experiment. Transfection efficiency goes significantly down if you selectively, if you saturate the cells with a monoclonal antibody against alpha 5 beta 1, the transfection efficiency comes down. And that is consistent. But if you saturate the cells with a monoclonal antibody against alpha B beta 5 or alpha B beta 3, the transfection efficiency does not come down. This is consistent with, with the thinking that this lipopeptide, the liposomes of this RGDK lipopeptide delivers genes through alpha 5 beta 1 integin receptors. So now we were talking about ex vivo techniques first. Significant, so now, now, now this is, this is not, no more uh, DNA vaccination, this is direct uh, anti-cancer therapy, right? So you establish the tumor first in a mice, and then take an anti-cancer P53 gene in complexation with the liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide and see this is tumor growth is significantly down. But for the other control lipids, which is not alpha 5 beta 1 integin receptors, which are overexpressed in tumor endothelial cells, right? They, that didn't happen. And buffer didn't, didn't reduce the tumor, but only target the RGDK is the ligand for. for Integin alpha by beta 1, but not RGEK. That's a control liposome. So this is perfect. And, and then, therefore, we have a liposome of RGDK lipopeptide that can deliver anti cancer genes, later on, we saw drugs also to selectively to tumor cells. So this is now we're back into the third part of our talk the liposome of, uh, you know, targeted liposomes in targeted cancer therapy. The control lipid. RG, if you replace K with L, that doesn't work. It doesn't go via the alpha 5 beta 1. The transfection doesn't come down when you saturate the cells with monoclonal antibody against alpha 5 beta 1. Now, this liposome can deliver genes into tumor vasculature. So if you grow a tumor and cut a microsection, and then you mark that, label that vasculature with a BWF marker, vascular tumor endothelial marker, and, and same place, if you take a GFP plasma, uh, D, plasma DNA encoding a green fluorescence protein, GFP, then you can see the expression of the green protein in the same area 
at the tumor vasculature actually is this proves that our liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide, which is alpha 5 beta 1 integrin selective, delivers the genes to tumor vasculature. And therefore, it kills the induced apoptosis in tumor vasculatures. And therefore, anti-angiogenesis happens. And, and you know, similarly, RGDK, like RGDK, RGDGWK lipopeptide, liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide, RGDGWK lipopeptide also targets uh, you know, genes to tumor vasculature. Wherever we saw signature of tumor vasculature, same place. So therefore, these lip liposomes of RGDK, RGDGWK lipopeptide can also deliver genes to tumor vasculatures. This is a publicity slide on but it was highly covered in Science Business Express and Nature India. The therapeutic RNA interference also can be done with the RGDK lipopeptide, liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide. So RNA interference means you are, uh, you know, you want to reduce, inhibit the expression of a particular protein. So you use, uh, you, you, and the protein comes from the mRNA, right? So you use a short RNA sequence, about 20, 21, 23 nucleotide long, siRNA, a small interfering RNA, which binds to the mRNA, and then the mRNA is cleaved with the apparatus of the, uh, you know, uh, RNA interference. So we use successfully the liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide to deliver CDC20 siRNA encapsulated within the aqueous compartment of the liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide. Why CDC20 siRNA? Because remember, the, uh, the cancers are growing uncontrollably, cancer cells, right? So the grow means one cell is getting divided into two cells, two getting divided into four, like this, right? So that happens because the mitosis uh, is happening how, how mitosis happens? So if you look at this, the DNA has been replicated, right? A, a cell, cellular a chromosomal DNA has been replicated. Now that has to be separated from, to form two cells, right? Now what uh, that happens in various stages in the metaphase of the mitosis, these replicated DNAs are held together with this cohesion complex, SCC1. And then and the mitosis, at the onset of the mitosis, a protein, an enzyme called separase actually cleaves that SCC. Before that onset of mitosis, the separase remains inhibited by securine, right? The securine actually protects this replicated DNA till the onset of mitosis. Now, the securine, at the, at the onset of mitosis, the securine gets ubiquitinated by the, uh, you know, ubiquitinous enzyme, uh, APC. APC actually needs to be activated by another protein called CDC20. So if CDC20 binds to the anaphase promoting complex, then the evicuitinylation activity of the securin takes place. Securin gets degraded, the separase gets free, the free separase cuts the SCC1 cohesion complex, the replicated DNA separated, and now the two cells separate. That's how. So we decided to use the siRNA against CDC20 because that will cleave the CDC20, therefore APC will not be activated. Therefore, securin will remain bound to separase, and separase will remain inhibited by securin, right? And therefore, the cells will be arrested in the metaphase. It will not be divided, and eventually focuses, right? So we showed that that happens in both protein level and, and, and CDC expression, both in the protein level and RNA level, and by cytometry and showed that established tumor is significantly inhibited up to 23 or 22 days. Beautiful. And, and, and then tech, this is about 180 to 80, 90 uh, nanometer size. So therefore, these liposomes can also not only deliver uh, plasmid DNA, but also deliver small interfering RNA uh, and integrin receptor selectives, right? So they can be used for anti-angiogenic cancer therapy. More recently, we used, uh, you know, neuroblastoma targeting fatty acid GABA zero. You know, GABA, GABA acid, GABA and receptor, GABA, uh, you know, uptake inhibitor, nipicotic acid is an inhibitor for GABA transmission. So that this uh, nipicotic acid derived cationic amplifier we made, and so this is the nipicotic acid derived cationic amplifier. It's not car. We gave the name, and so we could we could deliver small interfering RNA selectively to neuroblastoma cells, which is very, very drug resistant. In a child, 
uh, you know, pediatric cancer, 13% of the pediatric cancer actually, cancer death happens because of neuroblastoma, right? And that we showed that it, it works, it delivers. And, and, and the neuroblastoma and node mice model, we show significant inhibition of the neuroblastoma. Then we went from, from plasmid DNA delivery to SIRN delivery, then started delivering drugs. To start with, we started with curcumin, the healthy, the golden spice of India. If you look at the structures, this is a great compound actually. If you look at the structures of the curcumin, it's pretty hydrophobic, right? And therefore, it's almost insoluble in water. You sprinkle healthy powder, it doesn't dissolve in water, right? So the major challenge is to solubilize it. And it is so good for so many things. Why can't we make so many things? You know, and it kills so many cancer cells, right? And then these are highly hydrophobic molecule and therefore extremely water insoluble. So what we did, this RGDK lipopeptide is, is, is a golden, you know, golden thing in, in our hand now. So that we find that the liposomes of RGDK lipopeptide can nicely solubilize. If you remember, the lipid bilayer area is hydrophobic, inside is hydrophilic, outside is hydrophilic, but the lipid bilayer area is hydrophobic. We could dissolve, we, can, we could solubilize significant amount of calcimine in the lipid bilayer area, and that actually protected the established tumor, right? And it was very promising. The concentration was fairly high, 500 microgram per ml, which is pretty high. So, curcumin, now from plasma DNA delivery to SIRNA delivery, all anti-cancer, right? To drug delivery. Now, we could drug simultaneously deliver two drugs. One is hydrophobic curcumin, other is doxorubicin, highly used hydrophilic liquid soluble. Now we took the RJDK, we make it regulated as Professor Beat pointed out in the introduction, right? Uh, that that you know, if you put a pegel, the liposome becomes circulation stable. It becomes more stable in presence of all plasma proteins. So these liposomes with a pegel chain, and on top there's a there's a RGDK for delivering it to tumor vasculature, and then the curcumin stays happily in the lipid bilayer, and the doxorubicin equals uh, anti-cancer drugs goes inside the liposomes. And that actually, you know, increased significantly the overall survivability more than almost 70 days, right? This was significant results. Uh, uh, and so therefore, liposomes can deliver drugs, SIRNA, again, SIRNA, this is another, you know, highly self-penetrating lip peptide, about 11 more, and that is HIV borrowed. That's how HIV enters cells, right? And so this sequence we put on top of the uh, lip, liposomes, and that also increases survivability to 70 days. These are all good things happens. And finally, we show that DNA vaccination, it works under preventive mode, but not under established tumor mode. Drug delivery, anti-angiogenic -can anti cancer therapy, yes, it works, but eventually all the mice die. So we are getting desperate. Now we combine both the techniques. And first we showed that in, in, in combating one of the most difficult tumors in the world, is brain tumor. Brain tumors is difficult because it's very difficult to deliver the drugs to brain because the brain is, is there's a blood brain barrier there. The brain area is highly protected by, you know, the, a, a huge number of uh, cells, astrocytes, pericytes, they nicely cover it so that the blood-borne toxic things cannot be spilled into the brain, right? That's blood-brain barrier. So what we thought that nicotine, all of you know what happens when you take nicotine, fill up, right? So we decided that, that therefore that definitely crosses blood-brain barrier. So our hypothesis was if we can covalently tack this kind of structure in the head group of the cationic lipid, then that would would that liposome would really cross the plasma um, blood brain barrier and reach the brain tumor? That's exactly what happened. Tremendous survivability enhancement. So the liposomes with having an anti cancer drug, WB103, this is JAKSTAT, that the inhibitor, JAKSTAT inhibitor, which is that this kinase actually involved in tumor cell proliferation. You inhibit it, tumor cell proliferation is inhibited. So this is a significant 500% overall survival enhancement and
This liposome selectively grows to brain. We showed that this was again covered by advanced science news. And, and you know, more recently, very recently, uh, we shown that another uh, psychostimulant, beta amphetamine, if we put covalently in the eight group area, that also enhances tremendous survivability, significant survivability. Even RTDK lipopeptide crosses uh, in a blood brain barrier, and we showed that it goes and reaches brain. And, and we used both small molecule drug and, and, and SIR, STAT 3 SIR, and it worked. And most recently, in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic, we show, so if you look at this structure, right? Let me explain the combination therapy here. The, the brain tumor, significant overall survivability enhancement. What do you do? We have combination approach. In one approach, you are using liposomes to deliver drug and in the other approach, we used our in vivo DC targeting system. Remember that two together. So this is in vivo DC targeting genetic immunization, assignment three of this injection and three of this injection. That resulted in this long survival enhancement. Tremendous results. And same thing happened here, but we have not tested the combination yet. Only the chemotherapy part we have so much showed that psychostimulant type of molecule, if you covalently tag, that works. It grows, it, it targets, it delivers drugs to brain. And, and same thing for RGDK lipopeptide, that also crosses blood-brain barrier. And in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic, we also showed that same combination approach means two, com two methods combined can treat orthotopically established pancreatic tumor. This is the last result I want to show you. Tremendous, we are excited totally, because uh, if this combination approach has completely eradicated, in case of brain tumor, it's so hard, but still 500% overall survivability enhancement. But in this case, the complete eradication, if you look at this, this is treated group was completely, you know, tumor was completely eradicated. This is established tumor. And, and you can imagine that whole survivability, 220 days. This US patent is granted. So to take a message, tumor targeted liposomal drug, SIRNA carriers combined with in vivo, combine these two, result is a powerful anti-tumor platform technology. And this is so, so amazing. We are, but miles to go, this has just worked in mice, miles to go to take it to humans. We have started working on it, hopefully in the future, I can give you better news and to end, Acknowledgement. Yes, this has been true in my life. I have learned most from my students. I have learned from my teachers, my colleagues, but most from my students. All these 29 PhD students contributed phenomenally. I'm very proud to say that many of them are doing much better than what I am doing. I'm very proud to say that. I'm extremely blessed individual who get such dedicated, superbly dedicated hard work colleagues with me. Beautiful and 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 Yada is a lab assistant. Each one of them, Prasant is in ISC is Kolkata senior. Many of them are in abroad, they are in director level, senior senior principal scientist level. All of them are doing extremely well. My funding agency, my collaborators, previous collaborators now have established everything here. And my Raja Ravan and fellowship, and thank you very much for your kind kindness. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank, 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 thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor Choudhury, for the for the one for the wonderful, inspiring talk, enlightening us on liposomal drugs, gene delivery, DNA vaccination, targeted cancer therapy, and dendritic cell-based cancer therapy. Right. Fundamental complex mechanism. Its engineering aspects to deal with dead, dead, dead pool cancer, a life and death problem. Absolutely. We thank you very much again. Thank you. It was my now it is question and answer session. Sure. Should I come out of this or I can uh, see? You can me. come out of the presentation mode, then we have question and answer session. Okay, I'll write.
I'm back in the PowerPoint area. Can be, yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Sure. Yes, we can hear you. Very happy to answer. Yeah, you have to come out of the PowerPoint mode. Uh, so I put it down? Ah, yes, yes, you, you, are, you are coming out. Just yes. one more step. Yes, yes. Thank, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have, uh, we have a uh, few questions in the chat box. Aurobindo, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, we have uh, a few questions from Priti Kormokar, IIT Patna. She has asked, is that lipography machine which which plays 96 cells well spaced? 96 well placed, yes. That's, that's 96 well placed. We, we played the cells in 96 well placed, correct. Ah, so thank you. Uh, the next question is, I, I, I have one question. Uh, what, what kinds of forces interactions exist between the liposomal drag and, and body cells? What kind of? Forces or interactions exist between liposomal drag and body cells. What, mean, what I mean, uh, uh, what I mean, polar forces or... Uh, well, forces or mixture of both actually. Uh, if you look at the structure of the cationic liposomes, these are mostly cationic liposomes, right? So cell surfaces are negatively charged, right? So initially, electrostatic concentration of the liposomes can easily happen, right? And after that, the fusogen, if your liposome is enough fusogenic, it nicely fuses with the cell membrane. But there's a danger. If there's this possibility that this could be ended in an endosome, right? So the liposomal entrapped drug has to be released from the endosome. That's the problem. That still remains a problem, actually. Uh, there are ways to uh, improve the endosomal release by using, uh, you know, endosome disrupting lipids like histidinylated cationic lipids. Uh, those I didn't talk, uh, but there are ways to disrupt endosome also. So you incorporate elements of endosomal disruption and you get more of drug actually available. So the, the interactions are at multiple levels, electrostatic level, fusogenicity level, endosomal release level inside the cell. And then if it's a gene delivery, the gene has to be translocated to, to nucleus, cell nucleus. Uh, for that, as I told you, endosomal release is a must. Uh, did I answer your question or? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, please. I have another question, more general one, general question. Yes. What are the major hindrances to achieve ultimate solution for cancer? What is the major? What are the hindrances to achieve ultimate solution for cancer? Yeah, I mean, like like I said, that the major problem is that you know, during treatment, if it's an early detection, it's mostly Combatable now, right? We we can combat cancer, but if it reaches a serious advanced stage, right? Stage four, they call it. It has reached the metastatic level. So metastasis to other organs. In other words, the tumor grows in one area, stays in one area, does not metastasize, does not spread to other parts. That those are curable. But some tumors are metastatic in pancreatic cancer, for example. It metastasizes the nearby liver, and the liver function fails. So that is a major that is a major crisis to to stop the metastasis to other organs in the body. So therefore, the, the, unless you combine different things, uh, some metastatic inhibition, you know that, and also I didn't talk much about today in immune checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, so as the tumor grows, the immune cells the immune cells are you know, good in, in killing tumor cells, uh, but the growing tumors are also smart cells. They also have evolved mechanism to fool the immune systems, right? By inhibiting, by checking them. Those are called inhib checkpoint inhibitors. Right? That, so therefore, those are the issues now. That how to evade, you know, that tumor cells evade immune system. So immune cells cannot take care of the cancer cells, cannot kill them. 
So how to do the, how to boost the immune systems. These are the major areas now. This is a cancer immunotherapy. And dendritic cells is playing a major role. Uh, if you can boost the dendritic cell antigen presentation, tumor antigen presentation by the dendritic cells to the T cells, as I told, then you, or your chances of you know, winning cancer, beating cancer, would, would be high, very high. So they may, another thing they call cancer stem cells. Sometimes, you know, all the cancer cells, killing all the cancer cells are impossible. There are some few tiny percentage, those are always there, those are called cancer stem cells. They are so much inaccessible, it's impossible to kill them, and they ultimately grow, and then tumor grows. So this is another problem. There are many, too many problems unsolved. But uh, our things that's only working in mice, there's no guarantee to work in human, so we are looking forward to it. Uh, but how many cancers, for example, we could not eradicate brain tumor, but you can solid, you know, melanoma tumor with a combination approach, right? But yes, miles to go. I mean, it does, it, the mere fact that it works in mice doesn't guarantee it's going to work in human, right? So very, Thank you very much. Next to our... Hello. Uh, our next question is, is liposome of nanocyte? Yes, these are mostly the, the liposomes that I talk today is around 120 to 200 size nanometer. Very small. Very yes, small. right. So they are perfectly injectable. But orally, we have not succeeded. We have not done tests. As the beat was mentioning about oral, yes, it, it's not. We have not. It's mostly injectables. Intravenously, yeah. We have another one, last question. Please. Is there any side yeah. effect for this liposomal drug? This is asked by Piti Karmakar. Is there any side effect of this liposomal drug? There is no magic bullet. Is right? there any? Yeah, I, I got the question. Yes. The, the answer is this, right? You, although in a, it's great to say in words that you have a ligand on top of the liposomes, and therefore it will go only to tumor cells and nowhere else. No, that never happens. Why? Because liposomes are nicely fusogenic anyway, right? So there will be some percentage of the liposomes that will be nicely fusing with other cells. Therefore, you know, hello. So uh, there, yes, we can hear you. Therefore, complete selectivity only to is I concept, magic bullet, whatever happens. That's why even liposomal, if you use only liposomal drug delivery, with either can immunotherapy therapies, and you may not success. Other places, some liposomes definitely more accessible places. You're trying to treat a pancreatic by his liver, right? It'll go to liver. It does go to liver. It goes to lungs. If it if it reaches, so you know these are these are unsolved. Actually, pure liposomal drug is a solution for cancer. I nobody should claim that, in my opinion. Be some side effects, but how much side effect? That's the thing. If, can you live with it? Those are things. Liposomes have. Otherwise, there are about eighteen currently available FDA approved liposomal formulations of drugs in the market. So it it has some future, but definitely. Will be there. Another question has come uh, uh, after delivering drug to our body. How these liposomes come out from our body, or those remain there? Very good. Well, I mean, this is uh, difficult to read how much the body, but the, even if it's retained, it's a little right. Unlikely to be like like gold nanoparticle. If gold stays inside the, you know, lipid molecules, there will be some metabolism structures. There could be some sort of toxic metabolites possible. Yes, but so far, uh, no huge adverse side effects. Not many are reported. Yes, but. It's the lead will be metabolized, right? To smaller fragments. 
<laughs> and another thing that is very important that I that that we use are in range, not even milligram, right? In in mice. So I mean that's not that lipid that you are injecting. In the combination approach for three times, few micrograms of each time. So there are few micrograms and that will be metabolized perhaps over time. Hopefully that will launch an toxic effect. But depending on the structure of the lipid, if there's some structural component that might be toxic this and to others. So that, yes. But yes, in general, simple long chain containing lipids are not that toxic. They're not that toxic. Even if they're retained in the body, they metabolize are not that toxic. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we, uh, we have one more question, I think. Uh, Please. Yeah. Our strategy could be adopted to increase the half life of exosomes in the cal in the circulation. Exosome or liposome? Exosomes are a bit a little bit different. Is it exosome? Exosome, yes, exosome. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, so the liposomal strategy is used regulation, right? So. Maybe you can add a pegylated lipid in the exosome formulation that might uh, enhance the circulation stability. What happens actually when you inject liposomes, I'm talking about liposomes without having any peg, right? Uh, non pegylated liposomes. What happens in, in the serum protein upon injection, in the serum there are lots of proteins, hydrophobic proteins called opsonin. Right? Because opsonin proteins, they have hydrophobic part and hydrophilic part both. Their hydrophobic part actually gets absorbed on the liposome by their you know, hydrophobic side, right? And, and then those opsonized liposomes get targeted to liver macrophage, for example, because the other part of the opsonin has a receptor in the liver macrophage or lung cover cells, right? Uh, I mean, these, th so therefore, if you want to inhibit opsonization process, the opsonization process, how does it happen? The hydrophobic part of the opsonin, the circulating in the, in the serum protein, those get absorbed on the, lip on, the, on the liposome surface, right? So you want to abolish that initial absorption of opsonin on the liposomes. How do you do that? You make the liposome surface watery by putting a peg. Polyoxyethylene peg, pegyl functionality, they bring lots of water with it, water of hydration, right? So that makes the liposome surface watery, and therefore hydrophobic absorption cannot take place. The liposome stays circulation stable. The liposome stays circulation stable. So maybe in the exosome, if you are adding a little bit pegylated, uh, commercially available peg, peg lipids, right? Peg, DOP, uh, peg. Regulated DOP uh, that might uh, increase its circulation stability. My opinion, I don't know whether anybody has tested it. I think they must have tested by now. Thank you very much, Dr. Chaudhary. all our questions and answering uh, to the to the best of our satisfaction. And uh, now. I request Dr. Salmali Chakravarti, head of the Department of Chemistry, to present vote of thanks. Dr. Salmali Chakravarti, please. Dr. Salmali Chakravarti. Is Roybotov Sengupta present? Hello. Hello. Dr. Salmali Chakravarti, please. Maybe some connectivity problems or something. Dr. Salmali Chakravarti, please present vote of thanks. Hello. Hello. 
हेलो डॉक्टर गुप्त No, she is not. She is not. Oh, she has joined. She has joined again. Okay, then we will wait. Uh, you please uh, present vote of thanks because uh, she is not able to do that because of some problem, network problem. Okay. Okay, so uh, sir, shall I deliver the vote of thanks then? Yes, 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 yes. yes okay, okay. So it's an honor for me to deliver the vote of thanks here. So I thank the esteemed speaker today, Professor Arabinda Choudhury, for delivering such an illuminating talk, which enriched us very much in this topic about which. we are i mean interested about it for uh, reasons no, no, please uh, please uh, uh, video you please uh, keep your video on which are which are for reasons which are easily expl explainable so i thank the speaker once again for such a wonderful talk and we hope that we will again have him with us for some talk in some point of time later and i thank dr kartik gupta the convener of this national webinar for making such a wonderful initiative possible i thank the members of the seminar committee for all their initiatives and i thank the department of chemistry the faculty members of the department of chemistry for their efforts and last but not the least i thank our respected principal sir for all his support and initiatives so i hereby conclude my vote of thanks thank you dr roibhata sen gupta uh, before concluding the today's event i just i, I have one announcement uh, for the participants i thank all the participants uh, and i request them for uh, for the feedback form i it would be delivered to their mail mail id and it may take some time because of technical problems so with this announcement i uh, i close the event thank you all thank you very much thank you